I have the immense pleasure to introduce you to IMI friends, I hope I can call you like that, um, to people who have inspired me personally in their work, from their work and my work. Uh, I think who are outstanding migration researchers. Also, also, I think there are people who symbolize how migration research should go ahead in the future in many ways, taking on a much more global, bold, and also theoretical looking things. Uh, first of all, Phyllis Garib to my left is an associate professor of sociology at Harvard University. Her research lies at the intersection of migration, economic sociology, and inequality. And within this area, she particularly looks at mechanisms that enable or constrain mobility and lead to greater or lesser degrees of social and economic inequality. And I've particularly admired the way you're able to interweave theory and innovative ways of using existing and new data sets, uh, both qualitative and quantitative research, um, in your uh, past publications. And you know, we've been working together for a few years also, thinking through new theories of migration. Um, secondly, further to my left, Chalar Özden. He is uh, a lead economist in the development research, in the development research group, right, mm -hmm. of the World Bank. And he, um, he also has extensively published on migration, but uh, Chala has also been on the forefront of really important initiatives in terms of data. I, for instance, mentioned the Global Migrant Origin Database, which has been a huge step forward in understanding the evolution of global mobility. And here also at IMI, we have gratefully made use <laughs> of uh, that effort, that enormous effort you, you, uh, you, you were centrally involved in in the past, and still you're at the forefront of many uh, development and migration initiatives, also the whole Migration Development Conference that we hosted here at Oxford a year ago. So again, I think that collaboration has been very fruitful. So again, I'm very, very happy uh, to be chairing this session. Um, without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to our two uh, keynote speakers this morning. And first of all, Phyllis, please uh, take the stage. And Phyllis is going to uh, talk to us about diverse mechanisms of international migration the Mexico-US case. So thank you for inviting me and allowing me to be part of this conversation um, here. So this is a book project that I'll talk about which covers the last 50 years of Mexico-US migration. So I'll first talk about this briefly. Uh, we were given 25 to 30 minutes, so I'll try to squeeze everything into that. And then at the end, I'll try to connect what I found in the Mexico-US case to, this, to studying international migration more generally. So, okay, there are about 12 million Mexican-born people in the United States today, and we estimate that about half of them are undocumented. So the questions I'm trying to answer in the book are very general. Who are these migrants? What brings them to the United States? And there are many, you know, different answers one can provide to this question, and many different theories that can, we can apply to this case. And I don't need to explain these theories to the audience here. I'll go over them very briefly. These theories have been developed in multiple disciplines. There have been efforts to combine them, to synthesize them, to use them in the same model, so on and so forth. So this is the framework I'm operating in. So again, very briefly, uh, according to neoclassical economics, it's about individuals wanting to increase their expected earnings. And migrating allows them to do so if there's a wage or employment gap between two countries. In the so-called new economics of migration theory, it's about families wanting to diversify risks to their income, any misfortune that might befall on them. And such misfortunes are usually common in countries like Mexico, where the economy is very volatile. So people have applied this theory. In the cumulative causation idea, distinctly from sociology, migration is a path-dependent process. So as people migrate, they don't abandon their social ties back home. So there's reason for other people to come and join them. And eventually, migration can become even disconnected from the economic incentives. So these are basically the micro-level um, motivations that we have come up with for migration. There are also different <coughs> macro-level theories that look at aggregate uh, contextual factors, like the segmented labor markets idea. In every advanced economy, there is a division between high-paying, uh, high-skilled jobs and low-paying, low-skilled jobs. Migrants are recruited to the latter. Once that happens, these jobs become stigmatized, natives don't want to take them, so you have this persistent demand for migrant labor. 
And another theory is that even a bigger, grander statement that has to do with capitalist expansion, it's the world systems idea. Once capital flows into a country, it destroys the local economy, that creates more mobility, and so on and so forth. And all of these theories have been applied to the Mexican case uh, to understand um, the flows over time. Now, most social scientists actually would agree that these theories are not mutually exclusive. So we can expect to see people migrating for money, people migrating to join family members, people migrating to diversify risks, uh, or all of these different motivations could exist in the same person. But then, this theoretical diversity that we have, we kind of lose it in empirical work. In empirical work, we fail to capture this causal heterogeneity underlying migration. So um, this happens because most studies, especially in the Mexico-US case, focus on the average case, the average migrant. And in this setting, it's typically a young man who's uneducated, um, comes from a poor family, typically rural family from the central west of the country. So this is what you see in most of the work. And secondly, people use these, this average case to <coughs> select among different theories. So which theory accounts for the average case? And they try to make statements about, well, it's about this theory versus that theory in the Mexican um, setting. And they're, I mean, this is a problematic, um, problematic approach because it, by design, sets different theories up against each other as if they couldn't work in a complementary sense. And it also presumes that these theories should work universally for everyone in our sample, and they couldn't work for different groups of individuals, or they couldn't work in different periods. So these are the issues that I'm trying to address in this book. And I basically want to allow for two possibilities. First, very simply, individuals might be migrating for different reasons. And second, different theories might apply to different groups, or they may become more or less salient under different circumstances. Now, the main question here is, how do we actually capture this kind of heterogeneity in migration behavior? So here, I have a distinct um, strategy. First, I fix the outcome and look at only migrants. And I try to search for different groups among them. And I define these groups based on shared configurations of attributes. And the assumption that I'm making here is that individuals who share these common attributes will face similar opportunity structures, both in Mexico and the United States. So if I'm a poor farmer from a rural community, the opportunities available to me will be similar to other people who are like me. But then these opportunities could be very different for someone who lives in the city, who has a professional degree, so on and so forth. So I'm trying to capture this. And we actually do this a lot in migration research, in social research in general, social science research in general, we try to look at differences between men and women, people who have college education versus people who don't, people who live in urban versus rural areas. So it's a similar approach, but I'm not just singling out one attribute or two attributes. I'm uh, basically considering multiple attributes at the same time, and I'm trying to define these groups uh, inductively in this multidimensional space that I have. Now, once I have my groups, I study the conditions that set apart each group, each migrant group, from the other migrant groups, as well as from the non-migrants. So what are the conditions under which each group proliferates? How is each group selected from the larger pool of the Mexican population? So basically, this amounts to asking three questions in sequence. Who migrates, when, and why? Now, the data um, comes from the Mexican Migration Project. So this is one of the largest data sources available on Mexico-US migration. And it's, it's been collected at the time I did this analysis. There were 143 communities in, um, in the data set. And in each community, the researchers go, and they randomly select 200 households. And they collect retrospective information on everyone in that household. So if a migrant is absent, they will ask the other family members to report on the migrant. Um, and um, the communities are located typically in the major migrant sending areas in Mexico. So this used to be the Central West area. But as time went by, they kind of reached out to other regions, like the border or the central regions, which are among the new sending areas. So the data is not nationally representative. But they have, collect, they have compared it to national representative data sets uh, from Mexico and from the US. And it seems to provide a fairly representative picture of the migrants to the United States. So the data have been collected between 1982 and 2014. So basically, each year, they go and they find a few communities. They do this random sampling. They interview people. And they keep adding communities over time. 
So what I do is I use the retrospective information to reconstruct the characteristics of migrants on their first trip to the United States. Now we have information on additional trips, but I want to focus on the first trip to avoid the indigeneity issue. So migration is such a fundamental thing that once you migrate, a lot of things about you change because you have migrated. So I want to capture people before migration can change them and really understand what is it that made them to consider migrating in the first place. So I have about 20,000 migrants on their first trip to the United States. The first trip occurs sometime between 1965 and 2010. This is the time frame for which I have the most information. I also have data from about 120,000 non-migrants in Mexico, so I do comparisons eventually. Now, the method I use, at least to start with, is cluster analysis. So basically, um, this is a method for discovering groups with similar attributes in the data. So this, data, this uh, method creates categories based on the attributes you supply it, and then places individuals into those categories. So it's a basically a um, classification um, method, and um, it's, it's, it's considered data-driven, which means that it uses the data itself to create a categorization scheme, which we can think of as a model to understand that data. And like any other model, we don't think of it as true or false, but we ask questions like, is it useful? Does it allow us to um, understand the migrant population in a parsimonious way while recognizing its diversity? And does it lead to patterns that can be validated externally? That's outside the data that generated the grouping. So I'll get to that um, eventually. So how does it work? I'll go through this very quickly. If there's any interest in the technical details, happy to talk about it. So first, you need to um, determine the attributes on which you want to partition people. And we know that for migration, several things matter, like your age, your education, your sex, your number of children you have, whether you're married or not, whether your family owns land, uh, uh, what your occupation is, so on and so forth, what kind of community you live in. So I use these personal attributes to classify people. And then you need to choose an algorithm. The stakes are not very high here. Most algorithms produce similar results. I went with a very generic uh, one. The most important decision is you need a way to determine how similar people are. So if you know all my characteristics, if you know all of Chalar's characteristics, how do you determine what the distance between us is? Here I use a very simple measure, which is called the city block distance. So basically all the attributes in my data are binary, whether I have high school education or not, whether I have land or not. So I difference me and Chalar on each of these attributes, take absolute values and sum it up. So if we're same in everything, our distance is zero, so we probably end up in the same loop. If we're different in everything, our distance is the maximum distance, so we probably are put on very different groupings. So the most important decision that you'll make here is that how many groups do you expect in your data? The algorithm cannot provide that for you. So what you do is you run the algorithm for different solutions, different partitions of the data, and choose the optimal number given some um, validation measures. This is like model selection and regression. So basically, I used several different measures, and all of them suggested the four-group solution to be either optimal or reasonable. Now, the important thing here is that this is not an exact science. So the measures tell you about the internal validity of your solution, so how well separated your groups are. It doesn't tell you anything substantive. So as a researcher, you need to look at it substantively and see if your groups are meaningful to you given what you know about migration. So it's a lot of back and forth. Um, having these measures is helpful, having the statistics behind you is helpful, but in the end, it's you, the researcher, determining what makes sense. And having some sort of external validation really helps. I'll get to that in a minute. So basically, four groups, this gives the answer to our first question. Who migrates? Who are the migrants? So I'll basically describe um, the groups here um, in a very simple way. So the, in the first group, the cluster one, um, a typical migrant is a man with no education, no family assets, lives in a rural community in the Central West. So Central Western Mexico is a historical migrant sending region. It's not the border, it's the Central West that has been sending migrants, most migrants to the United States. Now this is the stereotypical Mexican migrant that we read about. We also have some additional data for a portion of the data set. So the data set, we have 20,000 migrants. About a fourth of them are household heads. And for them, we have more detailed 
information. I didn't use this in clustering because I didn't want to just include household heads. I wanted to include everyone. But then I can you look at this data to better understand the characteristics of different groups. So almost everyone in this group, the first group, is a household head and married. And a typical um, pattern is making frequent trips, many trips of short duration, and sending remittances back home and eventually returning back to Mexico once a certain target uh, earnings have been achieved. So I call this group circular migrants to underline this back and forth pattern. Now the second group is in similar in some ways but different in others. So the first major difference is again a typical migrant is a man but much younger. So almost everyone here is a teenager between the ages of 15 and 19. Some education and the, the typical migrant's uh, family here owns either land or some business in Mexico. And they still live in poor communities in the Central West. So given the assets of the family, this person falls in the middle or upper wealth category in his community. So different from the first group in that respect. If we look at the partial data, we see that most migrants in this group are younger sons, typically the youngest sons in the household. They tend to be single given their age. They make one or two trips, they send remittances, and again, that they return to Mexico. So one thing that we'll eventually learn about this group is they're typically mobilized at periods of economic difficulty for the household. So for that, I call this group crisis migrants. The third group, mostly women, not all women, but about 65% are women here. They have some education. They're older than the other groups, typically married, and their distinguishing characteristic is the ties to prior or current US migrants. Almost everyone here has a father, a sibling, or a spouse already in the United States and um, they tend to be married and they make a single trip. About half of them don't work in the United States, half of them do, um, and eventually they become legalized and they settle in the United States. So the lowest return rates are for this group. And because many of them are migrating to join family members, I call them family migrants. But this is, again, a general characterization. Many of them are labor migrants, actually. So the fourth group, to me, this group was the most surprising because you read about circular migrants, crisis migrants, family migrants in the literature, this group um, really stood out um, to me. It was something that I, did, I hadn't read much about. So again, the typical migrant here is a man, but much more educated than everyone else. So it's middle school or plus, <coughs> owns a home, and lives in an urban community. And it does, he doesn't come from the historical central western regions. He originates from the border or central region. So distinct in his education, distinct in his urban locale, and also in the region in Mexico. And uh, they can be sons or heads. There are no typical patterns here. Likely to work in manufacturing, both in Mexico and the United States. The other groups typically work in agriculture or manufacturing. This group is more likely to work in manufacturing or service, job, service jobs and earns higher wages. And I call this group urban migrants because that's kind of the most, the thing that most stood out um, to me. So basically we have four groups with <coughs> distinct profiles. Now we can move on to the second question. When do we see each of these groups? Do we see any temporal signatures? And because we used you know, personal characteristics, maybe we shouldn't expect to see any differences. But what happens is there are very distinct temporal patterns here. When we look at circular migrants, these are young, uneducated men uh, from poor families. They were the majority group here. So the left axis shows the number of circular migrants as a share of total migrants between Mexico and the United States all first-time migrants, and the group made up about 70% of all migrants in the 1960s and 70s, but then declined in share, and also in absolute size, when we look at the data in a different way, and it became a minority starting in the 1990s. The second group, crisis migrants, these are kind of young boys from better off families. They kind of increased slowly through the 1980s, peaked in the mid-1980s, and at, in that period, they were actually the majority group among all migrants. Among, almost one in two migrants fell into this category, and then they declined in relative and absolute size over time. Family migrants, as one would expect, they were kind of increasing slowly but steadily. But then something happened in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and this group suddenly doubled in share, and then retained that level. And urban migrants, 
the group that not many people talk about, they were a small group in the 1970s and 80s, less than 20% of all migrants. But then, starting in the early 1990s, this group grabbed the majority. And nowadays, it seems to be among first-time migrants, uh, the group that's most heavily represented. <coughs> so basically, each group is concentrating in a different time period. In the 1970s, we see circular migrants dominating. In the 1980s, crisis migrants seem to be the most present group. Family migrants are always present, but they double in size in the early 1990s, and urban migrants are the majority thereafter. Now, this actually raises some questions about the differences we attributed to these groups, right? So Mexico is changing over time. Between 1960 and 2010, many things have changed. And maybe the differences we're observing these, between these groups are just a matter of time. So if we take education, for example, we know that education levels have been consistently rising in Mexico. In 1965, the average education was about four years. In 1990, it, has, it had doubled to about eight years. So think about this. Urban migrants, we find them to be more educated. Circular migrants are not that educated, but they're observed in different periods. So maybe it's just this education level that's changing. It's not the selectivity of migrants. So here, we're plotting the average education levels among urban migrants, our most educated group, and circular migrants, the least educated. And we see that the differences are quite stable over time. We see this kind of upward trend in each group, but then the differences are kind of stable. And the interesting thing is circular migrants are always negatively selected on education, so they're less educated than an average Mexican, and urban migrants are significantly more educated than an average Mexican. So it's not just the pool that's changing, but it's how migrants are being selected from that pool also seems to be changing. We can look at other characteristics. We know that Mexico is becoming more and more urban, so now we have more people living in the city, so perhaps that's why we see more urban migrants in later periods. So this is the share of individuals living in an urban residence um, in our data, and we see a flat line, and that's totally an artifact of the Mexican Migration Project data. So they purposefully went to rural areas because they thought it would be easier to find migrants there. But what matters for us is the differences between groups. And again, if we compare urban migrants to more rural migrants, the differences are stable over time. Same thing with wealth. Uh, we see Mexico is becoming wealthier. The income levels are rising with the increasing GDP. But the differences between our richest and poorest groups are pretty stable. So basically, this is all to show that there are distinct characteristics in each group. And they're not just a matter of the secular trends in Mexico. They suggest that the pool, the, the pool of Mexican, potential Mexican migrants is changing, but also selectivity patterns seem to be different over time. Now the question is, why? Now if you think about it, in, in identifying these groups, I only used personal characteristics. I didn't use anything contextual about Mexico or the United States. And I say these things, these kind of changing contextual factors, in order to see if the Groups were substantively different. In other words, I wanted to save something to externally validate the groupings. If these groups are really different, they represent different migration logics, and they should be responding to different conditions. So this is what we're doing here. And the question I'm asking is, are these groups responding to different macro level conditions? And I'm considering economic factors, policy factors, as well as demographic factors. And we can kind of come up with a long list of these things, but I look at the literature and existing theories to basically reduce it down to a few um, things. So in the neoclassical model, there's a big emphasis on wage and employment differences. So um, I look at the trends in those, especially low skill wages in US, the GDP per capita in Mexico, unemployment levels in both countries, also the border patrol enforcement budget. So over time, the United States invested more and more money in securing its border, and that obviously changes the calculus of migration. So in the new economics model, it's less about what's happening in the US and more about the volatility in the sending country. So researchers have used things like inflation rates in Mexico to track this volatility, or peso devaluations, which have affected the economy. They're highly correlated, so I use that. Uh, in the cumulative causation model, it's this path-dependent process, so we need to know about the migrants already in the United States who could pull others to, um, 
to where they are. And Mexican migrant stock is important. Visa availability for family unification is really important to um, capture those patterns. Also, we want to know about changes in, in industries that employ migrants, like construction. Again, they're affected by economic crises in different ways. The world systems theory tells us about the importance of trade and foreign direct investment, so we need to know about that. Birth rates have been kind of declining in Mexico, so the fertility rate from went from um, about seven children on average per woman to, to 2.5, I think 2.4 nowadays, so that's a big change. So basically all of these trends, now we're trying to see if they're related to the size of the migrant population, the migrants, um, sample and also the size of different groupings. So what I'm showing here are some results from um, a regression model, an ordinary least squares model. Uh, and the outcome is the annual number of um, first-time migrants per thousand of the population. And I'm running this model separately for each of the groups. And here I'm showing just some selected uh, trends that turned out to be significant. And the statistically significant factors are shown in orange. So first thing to notice is that the orange color falls into different attributes um, for different groupings. So if we look at the first group, what matters uh, is the US hourly wages. So this group is, increases in numbers when the wages are higher and uh, is lower in numbers when Mexican GDP is higher, and also is lower in numbers when U.S. spends more money on border enforcement. And some of these patterns, actually, just these three indicators explain about 90% of the variation in this group, in the circular migrants. And some of these um, correlations are so strong that you can even see them in raw data. So the yellow line here shows the hourly wages for production workers. We get a similar picture if we look at farm wages. It's almost like perfect correlation. If we look at border enforcement budget here in the yellow lines, you know, almost perfectly negatively correlated. So basically, this is completely in line with the neoclassical model. It's, it's a matter of wages, cost of migrating, that's pushing the circular migrants in and out, if we were looking for that kind of confirmation. For the second model, what matters most is the Mexican inflation rate. So again, if we kind of plot the raw data, we can see this kind of the rising number of crisis migrants corresponding to times of high economic volatility. So in the 1970s and 1980s, there were several peso devaluations in Mexico. Many economists describe this period as the lost decade for the Mexican economy. <coughs> Poverty rates skyrocketed, and many families actually had to protect their assets already in Mexico. And um, some case studies actually suggest this crisis migration to be increasing in this, uh, in this period. And if you also think about the characteristics of this group. It's the youngest sons. It's the person that you can deploy flexibly in the household while the rest of the household takes care of the business in Mexico. Now, again, this is in line with the new economics model. There are also some regional crises uh, in Mexico. I won't go into the details because Hein just told me I have five minutes. So there was a coffee crisis. There was an earthquake that were region that had localized impact. And what we see is crisis migrants increasing very sharply within these regions. So it's not just national events to which these people are reacting to, but it could also be kind of regional uh, events. So basically what I'm doing here is like trying to find some meso-level analyses to increase the confidence in the aggregate results uh, that we have seen in the model, which are basically correlations, not any kind of causal effect. Now, family migrants respond, among other things, to the availability of visas to Mexicans. And we can, again, see this in this picture. This is the US permanent residencies given to Mexicans, the yellow line. And it was flat until 1986. The big jump here occurred after the Immigration Reform um, and Control Act of 1986, which was a major legislation in the United States that legalized about two million Mexicans who could now bring their wives and children. So again, the family migrants are responding directly to this policy change. And the final group, the urban migrants here, again, this is somewhat of an enigma, and the explanation here is, I think, more complex. Uh, many people have suggested that after the signing of North American Free Trade Agreement, the cities, especially in the border region in Mexico, started to change. So there were all these um, export assembly plants that were established that started internal migration flows. But then the cities became saturated and people started to migrate 
to uh, the United States, so some sort of stepwise migration. And the urban migrant story seems consistent with that. The increase correlates with increasing trade, and the highest increases in urban migrants we're seeing in the border region. These are the top suppliers of urban migrants where that have been most exposed to capital flows from the United States. So basically, the points that I want to leave you with, what we have learned from the Mexican case, is that there might be distinct mechanisms producing international migration. And different theories <coughs> might apply to the behavior of different groups. Different theories may become more or less salient depending on the context, uh, context um, of migration. And basically, the main takeaway point here is that the importance of context, which determines who migrates, when, and why. And this doesn't make our jobs easier, because if it's all about the context, how do we know who the next migrant group will be? If we need to devise policy, and if all these theories are conditional on the context, then how, which theory do we use to make policy recommendations? So it's, I don't have an answer to those questions. I don't have any prescriptions. But what I can basically lay out are some principles um, for thinking about migration. So the first one is basically we need to get the scope conditions right. Um, so we think about all of these kind of factors, economic factors or demographic factors that might be in place, but again, they have, there are some necessary conditions for them to work. We wouldn't see circular migrants between Mexico and the United States if these two countries didn't share a border. In other words, wage differentials will push people to move only if people can move, can cross a border. So these kind of scope conditions are really important. And the second point that I want to make is that different people will be affected differently by the same condition. So um, if we think about poverty, a lot of people are exposed to poverty in Mexico, but only some of them take it upon themselves to respond to it by migrating. And it's no coincidence that it's household heads or the youngest sons who are migrating, because what they're doing is in line with their social and cultural roles in that setting. So I didn't have a chance to get into that, but qualitative data really show that it's not just these economic incentives, but who takes up these incentives and acts on them depends on the, um, on the social and normative context in the setting. Um, and finally, um, you know, if different policies, we need to really understand the logic underlying migration, right? So for these four groups, some of them are really reacting. The circular migrants are reacting to the opportunities available in the United States. So they really care about how much they can earn. Other people are really escaping the dire conditions, the devastation in Mexico. And some people are just trying to keep their families together. So they are very different logics underlying migration. And our policies might work differently. In the Mexican setting, for example, the circular migrants respond very quickly to border enforcement. Crisis migrants do not. They'll try three times, four times until they cross because they're desperate. So again, we can't expect our policies to have universal effects. If migrants are a diverse pool, then we need really diverse policies to manage that pool. So, thank you. Thank you, Felice. And I'll give the floor to Chala. Um, and the title of your presentation is Where on Earth is Everybody? Intriguing yeah. title. Now, first, I want to thank Hein and Oliver for inviting me uh, to give this talk. I, before coming here, so my, I have three small kids. My son asks, so where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to Oxford. He goes, didn't you just go there? And I realized I've been here four times in the last year and a half. And uh, <laughs> so it feels like I come here. This has been the place, other than Malaysia, I've been the most. So I'm grateful for the opportunity and the collaboration we've been setting up with IMI. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, also, I'm grateful to Ingrid um, for a whole bunch of things. One of them is she put all the bells and whistles on my name, which I don't do it myself. <laughs> but for a migrant, it's, it's great. And the second thing, she picked a very young picture from the internet for the <laughs> So I'm, I'm very appreciative. Uh, now, uh, so. Before coming, I was having lunch with my director, who's also Turkish. Looks like, uh, by the way, so when Fidesz was talking about the, the, the distance between people, I'm like, I'm thinking, 
they Hein managed to pick the two Turks who work on migration, who studied operations research for undergraduate and bailed out. Uh, and I'm sure if I talk a little bit more with Filiz, we, we will find out we grew up in the same neighborhood in Istanbul and went to the same schools and know the same people. So the cultural distances can be very small. Uh, but the, the, what I'm trying to get at, the presentations are going to be quite different. So when I, talk to my, I was talking to my director, she's like, oh, so what are you going to do there? I said, well, I'm going to give a talk. And uh, I said, and there are going to be very few economists. So I asked her what I, how I should prepare the presentation. She goes, which she has done many of these things. She goes, the, the, the trick to a keynote, it's a fine, delicate balance of self-promotion and this grand picture of what the field should proceed. Right? So that's what I'm going to try to do, more on the, <laughs> more on the how the, the field should proceed and much less on the self-promotion. So, and I also realize, uh, uh, I, you know, I'm keenly aware of my shortcomings. And one of them is I'm really bad at picking titles. So I actually took this title from an old paper we did with Chris Parsons, who used to be at the IMI. Where on earth? Where on earth is everybody? So uh, the 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 what I the, the message of this talk is the following. It's very simple. We have huge data shortcomings in migration, especially compared to other fields in economics. I mean, the the field we're closest to is labor economics, and labor economics has the best data, right? But of migration has the worst data in in many ways. So. We try and we complain about, uh, sometimes it becomes a crutch for bad research, we complain about the data. And we have made great progress, and as part of my task in the bank, providing what my director calls global public goods, we construct these databases. And it, it helps in many ways, but there are many development questions that are unanswered with the existing data, especially the existing databases. Even if we had high quality data and complete data on that database, there are still many questions unanswered. It's just in the nature of the database itself. So what I'm going to talk about is how we can combine different data sets and databases in really innovative empirical methods to answer some of the key development questions that are related to migration. I hope this makes sense. Okay? Uh, so that's what it's going to be. But now I realize it's also uh, a mixed audience, so I thought how should I you know, get people excited? So let's start with soccer. Uh, this was the, the, the final uh, this year. I'm a big Barcelona fan, so the Barcelona picture is bigger than Juventus. Uh, apologies to the Italians in the audience. But the trick, the important thing here is that, you know, both teams are the Spanish or Italian teams, and they're not, because they just happen to be based in Spain or Italy. But if you look at the production pattern of the output, which is the, the, you know, the game we all enjoy, it's completely uh, international, multinational output, right? They, they have actually very few Italian or Spanish players, and it's the same thing with Manchester United and all that stuff. Now, why I'm, I'm saying, oh, and here's another one, and now this is Cote d'Ivoire national team, whom I'm hoping, I was hoping the Africans would do well in 2014, but didn't work out that well, so I'm counting on them 2018, and this is the reverse, where they play. Right? So the soccer market, or football market, is completely globally integrated. And you're going to say, why is this relevant? Well, actually, we have an all dormant project where we have collected data, for example, on soccer players' mobility, around 15,000 soccer players who played in the European leagues, and their mobility and their citizenship. Some of them have two, three citizenships. So you can answer, for example, interesting questions on mobility, and when you remove uh, labor restrictions through the Bozeman rule, how people choose their citizenship and where they play, and how the teams are formed to answer some of the fundamental questions, both in sociology, anthropology, as well as economics. But, so this is an example where you can merge, use the administrative data from soccer and uh, some other databases to answer these critical questions. Of course, migrants are not only there, they're also in the Academy Awards and the the Nobel Prizes, they're all migrants, but they have interesting things. For example, the three Nobel Prize winners here, they all work in the United States. Right? They came from all different parts of the world. If you look at it, you see this pattern. So what does this say about agglomeration in, in knowledge production? 
right? And it's the same thing with Hollywood. Hollywood and Silicon Valley have so many things in common, especially in external uh, economies and spillovers, that, and how this is used in the context, how the migration processes enable this are, are critical issues. Now, so these are just pictures to get you excited because you know some people get excited about football, others about movies, and maybe some people about chemistry. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But this is what I'm trying to get at is you can find answers to these fascinating questions in the unexpected places. Now, going back, migrants are everywhere. So, so you think if you look at the, the football market or the Nobel Prize winners or the Hollywood, you'll see migrants are everywhere and it is not. It's actually not the case. Uh, there is huge demand for migration. This is the percentage of the population that apply to the U.S. diversity visa. People are trying to come, especially at the lower end of the skill distribution. In the case of Ghana, 5% of the population applied for the U.S. diversity visa. I mean, it's an outrageously high number, if you think about it. Ghana, has, I think the population is around 22 million. Correct me, there was somebody from Ghana. Is it around 20 million? 24 now. 24? Okay, uh, my data is, I guess, two years old. Uh, but, I mean, but of course, people in, in the case of Ghana, they do, they submit multiple applications thinking they increase their chances. They cannot because the U.S. employs a very sophisticated uh, picture matching algorithm that they can actually see if you have submitted under different names, multiple applications. But anyway, so keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, but you see, you, know, you see it, and if you look at countries, let's say, like Nigeria, which is around 180 million people, if 1% of the population is applying for the diversity visa, it tells you something, right? Now, the, the projects we did, the, the migrants, the global bilateral migration matrices, they give us a whole bunch of things. So we, we get a lot of information out of them, right? We can do really fancy pictures that give a lot of insights. And it's great for the first class. So one of them is now we know, for example, the overall global migration levels really have not increased over the last 50 years, right? This is one of the things. Ah, this is, the slides are in the wrong order, I apologize. This should have been first. <laughs> so I actually, I came from the AEA meetings and I had, I sent the, uh, I had sent the presentation Ingrid and I worked on it, added a couple slides and then now yesterday I couldn't actually access the, the World Bank um, data um, intranet, so it's incorrect. So this is important, right? This is my favorite phrase. I have to put it in every presentation. But so the global migration databases, there are many challenges and you know, you all know about this now. Everybody, it's been used uh, thousands of times and it enables us to do these fancy pictures. We can look at the migration patterns, for example. Uh, one of the key things I have worked on is brain drain so we, for example, realize, we find out, we can see from the data, four countries in the world, US, UK, Canada, and Australia, attract almost two thirds of the college educated migrants in the world. It's, an, it's a ridiculously high number. Another interesting pattern that comes out, the second highest brain drain country in the world is actually England, believe it or not. Uh, but you know, you see these patterns, or we can do, because it's a bilateral matrix, the, the beauty of it, you know, the data, all of this data comes from the destination countries, uh, but we can, because we can complete the matrix, we can look at emigration rates, and you can look at who is losing their, uh, the highest ratio of, of their college-educated people. But this doesn't answer development question. It tells you, you know, who leaves or how many people leave. It doesn't even tell us who leaves or why they leave. For example, one of the things, uh, that comes out here becomes very important. If you look at the Caribbean countries, they have the highest brain drain, right, at the first set. And everybody's like, oh, Jamaica loses 78% of its college educated. Then you dig into the data, you realize we make mistakes there because that 78% includes Jamaicans who came to the US or the UK as children and obtained education here. Right? I'm gonna talk about the, the, the distinction, the importance of the distinction between place of education and place of birth in the high skill context. For example, these databases cannot answer that question. And that's a fundamental question in, in, in development, especially in terms of human capital 
accumulation and, and distribution. Right? So this was the, the, the stereotype. Right? You get your diploma, and this is actually, you know, it's not necessarily for Africa. It could apply to many other countries. But, you know, you'd get on the plane and go to the U.S. But is that really true? And turns out, in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. And you will not be able to answer these questions if you look at a single database. And the other thing, so this is one, one instance where just focusing, you, I mean, even some of the presentations at this conference, we, we, there are many reasons for using data from a single data set because it might be internally consistent or it might be hard to match things, but it, it limits us in many ways. So another project we did is uh, basically, uh, oh, this was, for example, how we constructed uh, the, 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 the matri uh, global matri migration matrices uh, const uh, using the gravity models. And along the process, it enables us to answer and determine the importance of different factors and look, you know, it enables us to say all these fancy things. You can do it even in a, in a you know, 200 by 200 matrix, and these do fancy graphs, for example. So we know where the, the accumulation, the net brain gain or brain loss losses are. So this is, and these are the, the fancy graphs we did, and you can do it by gender, which is very important, because if you look at the, the migration profile of women in the 60s versus in the 2000s, it's very different, for example. You, looking at the U.S. Census data, the number of women who migrate single, as you know, before marriage, has increased drastically. But not for every country, right? It has increased drastically for Europe and South America, but not for uh, South Asia and uh, especially, especially in India. So the, the, we can do this, but we cannot do a lot of the other stuff, right? So now I'm going to talk about three papers where we merge different databases, which enables us to answer the key fundamental questions. So the first one, especially in the context of brain drain, is the place of birth versus place of training. Right? And it's, it is a critical thing. I went to high school in Turkey, then went to college in the US, and did my graduate school in the US and stayed in the US. So is this, am I a brain drain for Turkey or not? Don't know. Right? I mean, it, it is not obvious because it's a continuous process. It's not a zero-one issue. Then there are people who migrate as children, right, and who do all of their education in the U.S. And there is that group. And there is a third group, which is very important in the high school context, where you would finish your education. You you'd say you are Ghanaian. You finish your education in the UK, UK and then come to the U.S. Right. Are you a brain drain for Ghana? Are you brain drain for UK? It's, it's not obvious, right? <laughs> and the databases we have don't answer these questions because they don't have it. The census-based data, for example, tells you where you're born. There are other databases which tell you where you obtained your education. Okay? So what we did is, uh, and this is ex especially important in the, cons in the context of doctors, right? So this is a... a we, uh, we started this project because the, the brain drain of doctors is, is a key issue, in, especially in Africa. Now I'm working with our IMI colleagues, uh, Yasser, and I don't know if Matthias is here. Uh, so it is, it is a fundamental issue because if you don't know who migrates or how many people migrate or the profile of the African doctors or the foreign doctors in the US, you cannot implement any policies. And there's all this talk about the ethical recruitment and all that stuff. It's all, it becomes all bogus. Right? So I'll give you some numbers. There are over a million doctors in the United States. 300, over 300,000 of them are somehow foreign, depending on the, the, the definition used. The numbers are no different in the UK, by the way. It's pretty much the same, and it's the same thing in, in France, but the parents are different. So what we have done, long and short of it, is we took the American Medical Association registration data, which tells the people it, because it's, it's, it's a licensing data, it has where you're born, uh, where you're educated, right? So we do know where people got their degrees. And then from the U.S. Census, we know where they are born and we know their occupation. So we did some fancy econometrics, which you might believe or you might not believe, 
right? That's the, the, the big fight with the referees always in journals. We can basically construct these relatively complicated matrices of place of birth versus place of education. And it provides interesting insights. And then on top of it, we can construct the age of migration profile. Right? So it does make a big difference. You are, again, let's say, born in Ghana, educated in Ghana. Whether if you come at the age of 23 after you finish your housemanship, or if you came, come at the age of 43 to the United States, right? In terms of how much of your human capital acquired in Ghana is actually used for the, to provide services in Ghana, right? So, now we're doing it for the US. Let me give you an example. And in, in many contexts, you cannot collect this data. I mean, even if you tried, it is way too expensive to collect data. So you have to do this. So I'll give an example. This is the Egyptian case. If you look at the US census, according to US census in 2014, there were 4,867 Egyptian born doctors in the US. According to the AMA, there's 4,062 Egyptian trained doctors, which is you know, pretty close as far as data sets go. But when we do our analysis, this is what you get. Okay? Only two-thirds of them are both born and trained in Egypt. So these are the people who trained somewhere else. Right? I'm going to get there. And these are the people who are trained in Egypt but were not born in Egypt, which is actually part of the surprise in this whole, whole exercise. These are, some of them, large number of them are other Arabs, especially the Palestinians, who, who are educated in Egypt, but other, other uh, there are Jordanians and Iraqis in that group. Now, but the exercise allows us to further uh, divide this, okay? So this is what you can get, right? So these are the people who came as children, for example. These are the people, most some of them, went to other African countries. And these are the people who trained in the third country. So these are the guys who trained, let's say, some big chunk of them in Europe and came to the US. Okay. And then these are the, the people that Egypt provides services. Now, the fascinating thing is there are 124 people who were born in the US and trained in Egypt. OK? So, and then, so there are 20,000 quote-unquote African doctors, Africa includes North Africa, in the US, and almost 10% of them were not born in Africa, and almost half of them were actually born, born in the US, which no data would tell you anything about this. What, what does it imply? It's kind of like my children, right? They are either on too cheap to pay for medical school in the US, but they have dual citizenship, so they go to Turkey to go to medical school, and then do their residence in the US. Big chunk of them are like that. But this is even a worse brain drain as far as Africa is concerned. Because if you are born in the US, if you have the US citizenship, if you are already have the links, the chances of staying in Egypt is much lower than somebody born and raised in Egypt. Right? So, the, the, but the more important story here is that the globally integrated labor market, the okay, high skill labor markets, are integrated in much more sophisticated ways, much more interesting and fascinating ways than our simple data sets. If you just were to look at the ACS data, the census data, or the AMA data would tell you. Okay? So we, the policies we construct need to basically take those into account. Now, the, but, but the more fundamental and fascinating thing, which we're, gonna, we're working on now, is the age of migration. Right? And it is very different depending on the African country you look at. So the Ghanaians. They finish school, they, they leave. Now we have another project in Ghana. We are now in the field right now. I had, I'm not a very long-term person necessarily, being the typical economist. So, but we had surveyed all of the medical students in Ghana six years ago, uh, all of them. We went to two medical schools, surveyed all of them. Now we're back six years later to see, to track these, these students, how many of them stayed in Ghana and how many of them have left, and to see if this pattern has changed. But as you can see, for example, these are the people who went to school back at, at home. There's a big difference between the Egyptians and the Ghanaians. And the, the Nigerians actually are much more flatter. They actually go much more slowly. They trickle into the United States. Right? So this is one thing. So basically, 
This is an example where you, you can merge administrative and census data uh, in cases where you cannot collect it. It's, it's physically impossible to collect data from you know, 300,000 doctors in the United States that you need to identify. And you have to rely on econometric methods to, to answer questions. The second project we have, I, you know, the, the place I go uh, the most after, well, almost as much as Oxford is, is Malaysia. Unfortunately, it takes much longer to get there. Uh, this, this, this labor market impact of immigration, which there's, all, there's very little research on South-South migration, especially labor-based South-South migration. Again, you know, because of data reasons. The data is just not there. In the case of Malaysia, close to 20% of the labor force are immigrants. And very much like the OECD countries, they're at the very low end of the skill distribution. So these are mostly Indonesian, Indonesians and the Filipinos working in the plantations and the construction sector. And there is uh, the concern, you know, the, the same worries about xenophobia and the impact of migrants taking jobs away from the natives and on and on. It's the exact same story, right? So we analyze the, the impact of, of, of migration on the lay on the, the native market uh, natives labor market outcomes so this again uh, you know uh, uh, is grateful you know I try not to use the words like you know selection effects and, and endogeneity and all that stuff but it is critical uh, to be able to you know th th this is the, the concept let me you know for those of you this is, I was so proud of to be able to do this uh, so this is uh, Malaysia, they share part of the big island with Indonesia. And what it is, you know, the migrants come, so they are, these are the plantations and this Putrajaya, the, the, the towers in, in Kuala Lumpur. So you, because of the, the, the endogenous reasons, the probably slightly exogenous reasons, you know, you're attracting migrants from the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia. But what it does is, then it affects the natives. So how do the, the, the issue is not just where the migrants go, but how the natives respond to this, okay? So there might be, and the, the, the response is not obvious. The automatic gut feeling, we say, oh, the, the natives just leave because the migrants are coming. It's not true because it depends on the underlying production function, the complementarity versus the substitutability between the natives and the migrants. And that's completely an empirical issue. So you have to rely on the labor force survey as well as enterprise surveys from the firms to, un to see what the production functions are. And it is not easy because merging these two databases, even in the context of Malaysia, which, is, which has really decent statistical offices in terms of sampling frames and data collection, it's, there are still problems, right? So the issue is there is the endogenous location choices, so the migrant workers come, and the, the questions we want to explore this was, this was our task. You know, they're the standard economic questions, but also we, they, we were asked to analyze the impact of migration flows on fertility. Okay, I have to speak really fast. Uh, and crime. So what we did is we, for example, for the productivity and wages and all that stuff, we, we, we got the data from the labor force surveys and the enterprise surveys. For fertility, we're getting data from the census and labor force survey, and for crime, we get the crime statistics. And it is not easy to merge these things. Uh, this was one of the slides I added, but couldn't load here. So, for example, so this is the standard stuff which everybody's interested in. We could find, for example, that there's a strong complementarity between the middle-skilled people, so people with high school education and the immigrants, because in a sense, the story is the, the middle-skilled, uh, the natives, basically work as the supervisors in the plantations and the construction sites, right? Which, given the, the, the racial and the, the social structure of Malaysia, has huge uh, social and political implications, right? And you can find the skill premium. And the much most interesting thing was the effect on crime, because the stereotype in Malaysia is all migrants come and they commit crimes. Of course, there's an endogeneity issue here, because the police is much more, I don't know what the politically correct word is, <laughs> but let's say they're much more keen on finding the, the migrants as the, as the criminals, right? Or convicting them, which is the case in, in many countries. But turns out, 
when you have the two data sets together, you can not only analyze the overall impact of migration on crime, but you can actually analyze the underlying channels which it goes through. So there are two different channels. One is the migrants might have different criminal behavior, criminal tendencies, higher or lower, but they also impact the criminal behavior of the natives by changing their labor market opportunities. And what we find is because migration is complementary to especially the high school graduates, natives, it decreases their criminal behavior and it increases the criminal behavior of relatively older, middle-aged, but low-skilled Malaysians who are out of jobs, who cannot compete with the, with the, with the migrants. Right? But, and we could also identify the impact on the property crimes versus violent crimes. Right? So these could not be done if you didn't merge the two, two data sets together. It's the same thing with fertility. Basically, by bringing Filipino maids, you affected the, the fertility behavior, how many children Malaysian women had, but it didn't affect, for example, their necessarily their labor force participation rates. But you, it's, it's tricky there because labor force participation rate and the fertility behavior is different between Chinese and the, and the, the, the Malays. Right? So, but these are interesting questions, development-related questions which now can be answered by using innovative ways of uh, merging data sets. So I'm going to finish quickly the exciting new issues, all right? which I think now this is the, the I, I finished the self-promotion part. Now I'm talking about the, the future part of, of where the development research goes. So I personally believe there are two big existential threats to us. One of them is global warming, right? which uh, I know very little other than teaching my children to recycle and justifying that why we're not moving into a bigger house in the, you know, the outer suburbs. Right? But the, the other big issue is aging. I mean, we are really aging rapidly. And I'm not talking about Japan and Korea. A lot of actually middle-income countries are aging. They're entering the, I mean, you, you guys are all demographers. They, you know this much better than I do. Uh, but they, are, they seem to be aging faster than they're becoming wealthier especially compared to OECD countries, okay? And there's this concept of, oh, if we could only remove the, the labor mobility barriers, we could solve all the aging problems of the world. I don't know the answer. We, we have a big project on this where we look at the interaction between aging and globalization, basically integration of both labor markets but also the product markets, right? But give you an example. So these are the dependency ratios of OECD countries, East Asian countries, and the South Asian countries. So East Asia, I mean, you see the, the, the rapid aging and increase in, 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 in um, dependency ratio. So if, for example, if we were to merge um, East Asia and OECD, completely remove mobility barriers, this would be the, the, the dependency ratio, assuming there are no endogenous responses in fertility rates, which obviously there will be, right? But just to give you an idea, okay? But if you do this for South Asia, things are different actually. It becomes completely flat, right? And the fascinating thing, the critical date is tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to basically remove the mobility barriers. I mean, the only pocket of the world where there is actually excess labor supply is South Asia and to a certain extent Africa. Africa actually isn't that big in terms of population. The only place is, is South Asia, right? Oh, this is, yeah, tomorrow, right? But to be able to answer these questions, we need, you know, data on migration and labor force surveys, and, but we also need projections from demographers. So that's where the problem comes. So, I mean, we all use the UN population data and, you know, it, Anybody from the UN for I continue? Okay. I have no idea where those projections come from. I ask many times, it's a black box. I think there's a room in the back, they go in there, they decide these are gonna be the projections and the data come out. Am I correct? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. I mean, in a sense, everybody blames the World Bank for really bad projections, but, I mean, 
And not only that, you know the fascinating thing? So suppose you want to look at the projections made in 2005. They don't exist anywhere. You can't find them. They update and delete the old stuff. But this is the, this is the error rate for East Asia. I mean, it's, it's just fascinating, especially given that you know, in a, in a 10 year interval, so this is, oh, this is the 1978 projections for 2000, and when we come to 2000, we looked at the data. And I can understand you might make an error for people between the ages of 0 and 20, because they weren't born, but how can you make such a big error for people who were already born? Right? So, I don't know. I mean, this is, I, I think part of the reason demographers and economists don't talk to each other because demography, they, they, they have a very mechanical approach to things. And, but, you know, women are not stupid. They, they, they respond to economic incentives in terms of their fertility decisions. So this is another example how off we were. This is 2004 UN DESA report on, on world population. This is the, this is the, the uh, fertility rates. So, this is 2004, somewhere here. Uh, the, the data comes from 2000, they say. So these are the projected fertility rates. Now I'm going to enlarge it and look at the, the, the f numbers for 2014, how off they were on the fertility rates. Right? So to be able, and look, this is not just academic you know, speculation and we're writing papers so that we can get promoted and, and get tenure and all that stuff. Hundreds of billions of dollars are spent based on these projections. I mean, the whole World Bank operates. How, where are we going to put the schools and the hospitals and the roads and everything? is based on these projections, and they're way off, and I have no idea how they're going. So this is, for example, very important. So I'll stop there, because I work with the UN Population Division. So, okay? So this is what we need. Now, the other important thing, this is, this is where I will stop, Hein, is the issue of endogenous education. The same way fertility decisions are endogenous, where you respond to, uh, to the, uh, the underlying economic and social environment, education decision is the same, right? And th there's a, some literature looking at, well, if there are <coughs> education opportunities abroad, how do you decide on education? And it can go either way. So my colleague David McKinsey has these papers uh, with Hilary Rappaport, which shows in Mexico, People, if you have social network and be able, are more likely to migrate to the U.S., you actually don't get education because the Mexican education is not valued in the U.S. Then there's a paper by Michael Clements looking at Fiji with, for the Indian community. It goes the other way around, right? So it's not an obvious thing because it depends on the underlying migration opportunities. But the critical one is how do the natives respond if they know migrants are coming? And, and there's almost no research on this necessary, I mean, really rigorous research. Uh, there's a series of fascinating papers by Borjas on the mathematicians, right? This is the similar thing. How did the, 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 the uh, youth leagues in, in Spain and Italy respond to the Bosman rule, for example? It's the exact same concept. If you know all these African and Latin American players are coming, what happens to the young people who are aspiring to be football stars? in Spain and Italy. It's the exact same concept, okay? But that's at the high skill end. What happens at the low skill end? And this tells you the strong correlation. So this is, now it, it's, we, we're working on this, and the, the issue, there's you know, a lot of uh, econometric issues. But you are seeing, as the number of the migrants in the labor force has increased, especially they're all low skill, pretty much, the number of people, basically high school age, who stayed in school also increased. Okay? But I don't know. I mean, it's very hard. It requires certain assumptions to identify the direction of the causality. But there's obviously some correlation. And it is very important for planning purposes in Malaysia, which, because they want to be a high income country by 2020. Uh, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is critical. Right? So again, this requires getting data sets from multiple sources and merging them using econometric tools. Okay? So I'm almost done. I had fascinating ones on the, which, when I mentioned the, the female labor force participation decisions. Uh, there are some papers on this, but we don't know. The other one is 
you know, we took the, the existing papers look at, okay, in Hong Kong and Singapore, if you can bring Filipino nannies, how do the women respond, right? Turns out they don't respond in terms of their fertility decisions, but they respond in terms of labor force participation decisions. Turns out in Malaysia it's the opposite. Maybe it's the cultural differences, we don't know, maybe there are other reasons, right? But what about the opportunity to migrate? How does it affect your uh, decisions? So this is, the, the last two decades have seen impressive improvements in education level of women all over the world. In the US today, medical schools, law schools, majority of the students are actually women. But this is the share of women, how it changed in, in, a, in a wide range of countries in 20 years, in, in one generation, basically, right? Rapid increase, over 50% in a large number of countries, right? And this has nothing to do with being conservative or low income or high income. But we have made progress in almost every country, right? But labor force discrimination continues, right? So a lot of developing countries are devoting resources because they listen to the World Bank, educate their women, but then they don't implement labor market reforms for discrimination because there are cultural dimensions. So what does this imply? Those women migrate, like Phyllis, right? So if you look at it, the shape. Were you married when you migrated? Here you go. <laughs> right? The share of single college-educated migrant women from that country you see the rapid increase, especially my favorite country, Ghana, right? And this, is, this has huge development implications, not in terms of labor markets, but in terms of all the other social dimensions of losing your highly educated woman, right? So, what do we need now? We need a lot of data, but you need, again, to be able to merge different data sets, and uh, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chalar. This was a fascinating uh, presentation. I think both presentations, although they were different, I think they highlighted what uh, data, how data can help us and better data can help us to uncover the uh, diversity of migration. But further than that also, I think when we think about theories, um, that there is no one single story. Whether it's about migration and development, whether it's about what drives people to migrate, that in my view, these presentations both highlight that we in a way need to move to the next level. We are not an exact science. We are a social science. The social reality is uh, complex and that is not a reason to throw in the towel which often happens I have heard too many times migration is too complex a phenomenon to develop to develop better theories I think it actually should be an appeal to develop better theories and actually uh, something that Phyllis also said uh, really resonates with how I think about this issue said theories are not social theories are by definition cannot be sweeping statements that apply to every single context in every single society. They are contextualized statements about certain me social mechanisms that apply under certain conditions. And when I was listening to you, Phyllis, and you about, for instance, the educational response to migration, it really depends on those conditions. But we couldn't leave it at that. I, you hear too often, oh, it depends on the conditions. We need to specify those conditions. And I think research done by both, both of you actually shows that we can uncover very clear patterns in that diversity, and that is the issue. And then we can discover that different theories that often are presented as being juxtaposed, and we need to have another empirical test to see which theory is true, that that's not the right approach. The real good approach is to uncover, because those theories often emerge in particular contexts to explain particular migration phenomena, which of course don't apply in other contexts, which doesn't mean if you find that one theory, let's say the neoclassical theory, doesn't work in one particular context, that you reject your theory altogether. That's why we're in social science, to understand the complexity of the phenomena we are studying, and this is also why I so much admire the work you're doing. We have little time, but t about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for q and I I um, propose we collect a few questions and then go back to the two speakers. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Great presentation, both of them. I have a very quick uh, question just to Felix. Um, I'm also working on Mexican migration and uh, I'm presenting a paper tomorrow about the link between Mexican migration and 
violence in Mexico. So I just want to know what is your point of view with regards to violence as a push factor. Uh, have you considered this? Thank you. Hot treat? Yes, I also have a question for Chile. Thank you for your presentation and the wonderful research. Uh, and I have a question about the K-means cluster analysis. I did more or less the same study in labor migration from Central and Western Europe, and also put it at four. And Hein is now making the argument that social reality is very complex, but sociologists always come up with two types or four. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the question is, what happens if you put it the number at five? <laughs> certain types. One that, for example, some people want to go to the United States just for fun, turn away blind to study. Well, yes, well, uh, I wonder why you concentrated with the Mexican migration policy. I'm very close friend of Doc Massey and Jorge Duran, but uh, I've been working with the current population survey, the American Community Survey, NOI, and many other very good sources that I, I think are much better. But the, the basic point is, I think it's very, very important to contextualize the analysis. And that is a key breaking point in Mexican-US migration. And it has to do with neoliberal, the, the, uh, the neoliberal model, which I think turns back a lot of what the neoclassical interpretation, but because that's based on that. And, uh, and that, you know, you, you have been an exponential growth, and Mexico suddenly became the first, and between the first and second immigration country in the world. But uh, also, and then go to Kakla presentation, just a, just a, a, a short comment. I, I've been studying recently, and this also has to do with the first presentation, uh, high scale migration for the three years. Uh, Mexico has 2.2 million uh, high scale according to uh, just one rate of uh, uh, high education. But you can see uh, graduate edu uh, education is more than 200,000. Uh, and and uh, what we found interesting is that if we consider uh, science and engineering, then you have the, the, uh, there are more uh, doctors in science engineering in the US and other countries than, than, than in Mexico. Um, and this has to do, I think, with another structural aspect which is important to consider, the restructuring of innovation systems. I went into and, and tried to analyze the ecosystem in C Silicon Valley. And I learned a lot about that. I cannot talk because it's, uh, I, I, I know we, have enough, we don't have enough time. But th there are many keys to understand you know, the patterns of this migration. And, and the last very, very short point is that uh, we found with a huge survey of 160,000 uh, graduate Mexicans abroad that they are allocated in nearly 80 countries all over the world. Uh, in, uh, and uh, in contrast with uh, general migration, which 98% are in the US, 20% uh, are all over the world in the case of uh, people with graduate degrees. Richard? Yes, yeah. as one of the other few Mexicanists here, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
She's right for you. When I showed the program to my colleagues in the office, they said, oh, all of this is an apology. So your presentation was the one that was the real thing. No, 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 don't say that. Take one more question, two rows to the back, yeah, the lady there. I've seen more questions, but unfortunately we don't have time, so I'd like to give the floor to Phyllis first. So I'll try to give 